This is Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you are welcome. (laughs) (laughs) You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback, and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Phetasy.com. You'll get access to behind-the-scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at Phetasy.com. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. Be sure to check out my weekly podcast, You're Welcome with Michael Malice, now on Podcast One. You might know me from my terrible Twitter, my horrible books, or the nonsense I spout on podcasts like Rogan and Glenn Beck. It's all there. Are you black-pilled or white-pilled for the future of the UK? What is a man? <laughs> what is a man? What is a no? I, what is the, I, are you white pilled or black pilled? No seriousness, girl. No, 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 I love the Jesse Lee piece of question. <laughs> the fact that you discovered that gives me hope for some of the things that I've still got well, that are missing. Well, if you need James G. Blaine's autograph, you are welcome to it. Of course, being the co author of How to Have Impossible Conversations makes you the perfect guest for this train wreck of a show. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> new episodes are available every Thursday on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podcast One, and wherever you get your podcasts. You are welcome. This week on the podcast, I'm excited to welcome James Kerchik. James is an award-winning journalist and author of The End of Europe, Dictators, Demagogues, and the Coming Dark Age. A visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution, he has reported from over 40 countries and is a columnist for Tablet Magazine. Kerchik has written for The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, and the New York Review of Books, among many other publications, and lives in Washington, D.C. James stopped by to talk about his new book, Secret City, The Hidden History of Gay Washington. I really love James. I love this conversation. He's so brilliant. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. I'm with James Kerchik, author of Secret City, The Hidden History of Gay Washington, and other books as well, but this is what we're talking about today. Welcome to Walk-Ins Welcome, James. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. I'm so excited to talk to you about this book. It's a, it's a tome and I'm, I have a lot of questions about just the book itself in terms of how you came up with the idea to write this as one of them. How long did it take you and how do you go about what is your process for a project this huge? Yeah. So I would say the idea for the book probably germinated when I was in college. And I've always been really interested in Cold War history, American politics, really in that period of time, 20th century. And I was studying with a professor named John Gaddis at Yale, who's like the leading Cold War historian. And he taught a class on the art of biography writing. Mm. And we would read bio- we would read a biography every week. And then the final project, we had to write our own, you know, 50-page biography of anyone living or dead whose papers were at the Yale archive. Oh, cool. So, yeah. So I chose a man named Larry Kramer, who your listeners may or may not know of. He was a very famous gay activist. He founded the organization ACT UP, which is the, you know, the real kind of in your face AIDS protest group. He also founded before that gay men's health crisis. He was a, a playwright. He was a novelist. He was a screenwriter and he donated his papers to Yale. And I got to know Larry and interview him. And he was a fascinating guy, very kind of cantankerous in your face, you know, activist type who was also kind of obsessed with gay history and recovering the stories of gay people that had been lost to history because he knew that, you know, up until very rather recently, this was not a subject that people talked about Mm -hmm. uh, homosexuality. Right. And so gay people in history were really kind of erased or forgotten. And so that was, I think, where this kind of idea maybe started subconsciously. And then a couple of years you know, I graduated, I moved to Washington, I started working at the New Republic magazine, I was covering politics. And the more I was living there, and the more I was reading about the city and its political history, the more I realized that Washington is a city that runs on secrets. Yes. And that's like, that's the currency and like how it, it's it's the currency of power in the way that, you know, fame is the currency in Hollywood and money is the currency, literally the currency in New York. Mm-hmm. Secrecy is really... Um, 
the currency in Washington, and that there was no worse secret in this time than being gay. And that might seem strange now, uh, particularly coming out of Pride Month, where you can't <laughs> turn your head without seeing a rainbow flag somewhere. <laughs> but, you know, those of us who are of a certain age remember that it wasn't always this way. And those of us who are even older or have read history, and I think what my book tries to show is just really how the word I use is, is fear, just the fear that surrounded the issue of homosexuality in American life, and in particularly American politics, that there was really no worse thing than to be gay. And there was this kind of funny quote that you might have heard. It's by Edwin Edwards, who was the kind of very corrupt governor of Louisiana. And in 1983, he was running for re-election and he said, the only way I can lose this election is if I'm caught with a dead girl or a live boy. Wow. And it's kind of funny, you know, it makes you chuckle. But when you think about it, like he was he was trying to be funny. When you think about it, what he's saying is actually very profound. He's saying the only thing that's as bad as murdering someone is being in love or I should say the only thing bad than, than murdering someone of the opposite sex is being in love with a member of the same one. Right. That's that's the point of what he was saying. And so that sort of inspired me to write this book. And I think because I figured, you know, if Washington is a city that's run on secrets, that's the title of my book. And there's no more dangerous secret than this. Then that must mean there's all these fascinating stories and personalities and phenomena that have been impacted by homosexuality and that I should really devote myself to studying it and putting it all together in, 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 into a book. Is there a modern equivalent of homosexuality as, as in some something to destroy a political opponent? Or what? what's the closest thing to it? Is there anything? No, I, feel like, I, feel, I feel like Trump in many ways is like, he's like battled through all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Like particularly the sex stuff, right? Because I think he's actually kind of neutralized sex as a liability in politics, right? Because this is a guy who's been married three times. Yeah. He has, you know, how many women have accused him of sexual impropriety? <laughs> the porn star. A porn star, <laughs> and yet, and yet, who supports him? Right, like the most socially conservative evangelical Christians, yeah, in the country support this guy. So I kind of feel like, like if there's one good thing about Trump, I mean, it's like one silver lining. It might be like this, like he's kind of obviated sex. I think maybe it's hard for me to think if there's anything now that sort of approaches the level of. I mean, I, you know, I, I would think if you were a murderer, then that probably would be the worst thing now. Right. But it's it's oh. hard to think of another kind of secret. Although even Trump murder. said he could murder someone on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. There you go. <laughs> right. And, they, and he's right about that. His supporters would probably continue supporting him. Yeah, that I was thinking a lot about that and listening to some of your interviews and and just reading parts of the book. And as I was saying before we started recording, I don't want to set unreasonable expectations for moms out there. I did not get all the way through this book, but it's so it's so dense and well reported and not lazy. My husband is like such a snob and he's so funny because I get lots of books for the podcast and he's always yeah. like this is 150 pages with thick margins and this and it has like the big font. This is not a 200 page book. And he was very impressed with the uh, oh. you know small print and small margins and the actual style of the book. It's that this has clearly taken you a lot of work. How long yeah. did it take you to write this? You know, it probably took all combined maybe five years. Wow. I think, of researching and writing. So yeah, it's definitely the biggest sort of intellectual project I've ever undertaken in my life. And it's hard for me to think of another subject, frankly, that would obsess me and, you know, that I would spend so much time working on. Maybe something will happen, you know, there's, there's still time for me to find something, but I'm not sure I want to do another subject as big and and massive as this one. How do you go about organizing a project like this when you're starting it? And where did you do your research and get all of your material yeah. from? So basically it starts with like an outline, mm -hmm. some like a Word document and just throwing out, you know, everything chronologically from personalities, presidents, scandals, you know, phenomena, like the Cold War, like McCarthyism is a big theme and just putting it all kind of chronologically. And then the first level of research is just reading books mm -hmm. that are, you know, so biographies or, you know, books about the Cold War, books about the State Department, books that I've sort of vaguely knew would be of importance to my research. 
there's really only one book that's been written on anything remotely close to my subject. There's like one book written about the lavender scare, which was this uh. period of time in the 1950s when gay people were purged from the State Department. That's like a short book. It's an academic book that was published like almost 20 years ago. So there really like weren't many kind of specialized books on this topic, which was which was a good sign for me that it would be, you know, worthy of a book of itself. So I'd start with books and then, you know, you're looking at the notes and all the books. So you're right. You know, where did those sources come from? So then it's a lot of old newspaper articles, magazine articles, you know, the popular, the periodical press, and then paper collections are a huge part. So paper collections of at, at presidential libraries, papers of various diplomats, uh, various important people who I write about, so like Ben Bradley, who's like the legendary editor of the Washington Post. He has uh, his, his papers collected over decades. Um, lots of classified government documents that I got declassified, right, from the State Department, the FBI, the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which is the predecessor to the CIA. Oral histories wow. um, of all sorts of all sorts of individuals, people in the State Department, politicians, family members of politicians, um, and then interviews. Right. I, I, I interviewed a lot of people for this book. And so that's basically where all that's basically all the research. Wow. How do, you, how do you even begin to like <laughs> synthesize all of that into deciding what gets in and what what doesn't make it? What's the what are some of the coolest things that you discovered or scoops in your book? I think the biggest like newsiest scoop probably involved this scandal that was never written about. I wrote about it in just a couple of weeks before Ronald Reagan was nominated by the Republican Party to be, to be president. A group of moderate to liberal Republicans who didn't like Reagan because he was a conservative. And this is this is back when there were moderate to liberal Republicans. Right. <laughs> they basically tried to get the Washington Post to expose what they alleged was a right wing anti-communist homosexual network controlling Ronald Reagan like a Manchurian candidate. Oh, wow. And they presented Ben Bradley with all of this kind of documentation that they alleged. There were sort of accusations from various men that they were you know, propositions by Reagan advisors. It was all kind of hazy and not very well documented, but it, it was concerning enough that Ben Bradley, you know, ordered his best reporters, including Bob Woodward, to go investigate this. And it's kind of a crazy story now when you go back and read the documents that I, you know, and I re write about it in the book. I mean, there was one guy who alleged that he had slept with Reagan and Reagan had promised him that he would be first lady when he was elected president. I mean, there's some really kind of wild anecdotes. That's amazing. From this story. <laughs> it does kind of show you the way that this fear of homosexuality really kind of gripped people mm -hmm. and could be used to explain anything. It's like almost like anything that seemed kind of strange or crazy or inexplicable people would resort to homosexuality. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie JFK, the Oliver Stone movie. Yes. Um, which is a great movie cinematically, but it's actually like a terribly crazy film because it's based on this prosecution, a real prosecution in 1967 of the only man who was ever actually prosecuted for the Kennedy assassination, a man named Clay Shaw, who was a businessman in New Orleans who happened to be gay. And he was basically targeted by the district attorney in New Orleans, played by Kevin Costner, mm -hmm. uh, and Jim Garrison, who basically alleged that there was this like right wing homosexual network that, and I'm not joking, that killed Kennedy out of revenge for the failure of the Bay of Pigs. Okay. <laughs> like basically what that movie is about. And people forget this because like it was, this movie came out 30 years ago. Um, but it was like a kind of controversial at the time right. because it was it was promoting this like whack job district attorney who had this crazy conspiratorial idea of the Kennedy assassination being, you know, planned by these right wing homosexuals. <laughs> that's, like, that, that's just one of many examples in the book of the sort of, you know, the, the ways in which people have reached for homosexuality as an explanation for things that are, you know, inexplicable or strange it's a recurring theme. Mm -hmm. I had never heard about the lavender scare until your book. And that mm. that's fascinating to me. Can you talk a little bit about the lavender scare? I don't I, I you know, everybody hears about the red scare, but that yeah. the lavender scare is seems just uh, hor horrific. Yeah. As bad or worse. 
So, you know, in, in, in Fe- February 9th, 1950 is the day Joe, uh, Joe McCarthy, the Republican from Wisconsin, gave that infamous speech in West Virginia where he's waving this list in his hand and he says, I have the names of 205 communists on this list. And over the course of the following days, I mean, it, was, it started a huge press kerfuffle and the, the number of communists would change depending on the interviews he gave. He wasn't exactly the most reliable figure. But just a few weeks, actually, after that announcement, the Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, is invited up to Capitol Hill to basically address this. And he brings a deputy Secretary of State with him, who in passing, he's answering questions about you know, the various people who've been fired from the State Department over the previous couple of years for you know, certain types of risks that they pose. And there are very, very few suspected of communism. But there are 91 who were fired because of homosexuality. Wow. And this becomes as a shock to the country. And it launches what we now have called the Lavender Scare. And there's a purge in the State Department, the CIA. It actually sort of becomes um, a weapon in the sort of bureaucratic warfare between the FBI and the State Department and the CIA. These sort of accusations of homosexuality become a weapon and they're thrown around. Um, And this goes on, this rages on for years. And then in 1952, the Republicans running for president, you know, the running for Congress and Dwight Eisenhower is running for president. It's actually a part of their campaign. Wow. Part of their slogan is to clean up the mess in Washington, which is partly a reference to the corruption in the Truman administration. It's also partly a reference to the sex deviates, which is how they refer to, to gay people in the government. And he then signs an executive order shortly after taking office that bans people guilty of sexual perversion, which is the term that was used for homosexuality. It, it prohibits them from holding any job in the federal government and explicitly from holding security clearances. Wow. And there are, we don't really know the numbers, but it's like an estimated seven to 10,000 people lose their jobs in the 1950s alone. And the Lavender Scare actually stretches on much longer than McCarthyism. I mean, you know, McCarthy dies in 57. He drinks himself to death. Um, and the Red Scare as a kind of cultural phenomenon, it really ends by the end of the 1950s. But this this ban on gay people working in the federal government, it's not lifted until 1975. Wow. And then the ban on receiving security clearances is not lifted until 1995. Wow. So it goes on. This goes on much longer than the Red Scare. And that was something else that's really interesting in your book about this idea that homosexuality is a threat to the secrets of the state and yes. and you're somehow more vulnerable. Yeah. I mean, this World, World War II is when I start the book. Mm-hmm. It's really that it, I start it then because that's when homosexuality, it transforms from just being a sin and a crime and a mental illness, which are the sort of the three ways that gay people are stigmatized in society. World War II, it becomes a national security threat. Wow. And the reason is because that is the time when America really develops a sense of national security. That, that term didn't really mean anything before World War II. We're, we're, we're entering the world as a global superpower. We are deploying you know, vast amounts of resources, military armies across the world. And we start developing a national security bureaucracy. And we need to collect and manage secrets, right? And we start developing a civilian intelligence agency for the first time. It's the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. And it is believed around this time that because gay people have this terrible secret, this shameful, you know, unspeakable um, secret that they would protect at any cost, that they would, if they're in a, if they're in a position of authority and they have information and they work for a government agency, the fear is that they will give, you know, secrets to enemies because they are more liable to be blackmailed. Mm. Um, And there's actually no evidence that this ever happened in the history of the United States. (laughs) Um, The government did a study on over 100 cases of espionage in the early 1990s, um, around the time of the gays in the military debate. And they discovered there were only six episodes involving gay people and not a single one involved blackmail. They all did it for money Mm. or perhaps an ideological reason. So there's actually no evidence for this. And the only case that was ever cited at the time in like the late 1940s, early 1950s, when the U.S. government was, when the Lavender Scare was beginning, there was one case of an Austro-Hungarian counterintelligence officer in the years leading up to World War I, 
who was a traitor. He had given, he was a spy for the Russians. He was gay. His name was Colonel Radel. But it turned out that the reason he was giving over secrets to the Russians was not because he was gay and, and was being blackmailed. It was because he wanted money. He was right. very greedy. He had a, you know, he had a wine cellar with 5,000 bottles of wine and multiple cars. And, but there was sort of this myth because when he was exposed, it was so embarrassing to the Austro-Hungarian empire that the military basically, you know, put out this story that the reason he did it was because he was blackmailed as, uh. as almost a way of kind of absolving themselves of responsibility. And so this became a sort of legend among Western intelligence officials, the wow. Radel case, you know, the Radel case proves why you can't trust homosexuals in sensitive government positions. And it wasn't until after the Cold War when the Russian archives opened and historical researchers were able to go and you know open up the files that they discovered that the Russians didn't even know that Radel was a homosexual. They didn't even know he was. So it seems yeah, like I, there are so many other ways to blackmail people too. Just what about guys who have affairs? What about, you know, gambling debts? What about right. and those were and those were if, if if for instance the CIA, you know, found out that you were a gambler and you had debt and you were working for them, or you were an alcoholic, those would be reasons to dismiss you. And there was sort of a paradox with this, with the lavender scare and with the ban on gay people, because by making it so that gay people could be fired, you're basically creating an opportunity right. for our adversaries to then induce treason, right? You're mm. creating a, a liability. If the government, the U.S. government were just to say, look, if you're gay and you're approached by uh, a foreign adversary and they try to blackmail you, just come to us and tell us that you're gay and we won't fire you. Right. And that would have obviated this entire problem. And there actually is one case that I write about, a pretty important one involving an American journalist. He was quite famous at the time, named Joe Alsop, who was a newspaper columnist. And he was visiting Moscow in 1957. And the Soviets set him up in a honey trap, right? So they set him up with a young, a handsome young man yep. in a hotel room, and they took photographs. And the next day they barged in and they basically threw the photographs on the table and said, we want you to spy for us when you return to Washington. And Alsop refused. Uh, wow. He sort of lied to them and said, maybe, you know, he's, he gave them a story, but then he went right to the American embassy. His friend happened to be the ambassador. He wrote out a nine page confession that was given to the CIA where it explained everything that had happened, all the tactics that had been used. He talked about being, you know, he says, I was in, I've, I've been an incurable homosexual since boyhood. So he basically went through the entire, his entire life story. He did exactly what, you know, the national security state would have wanted someone to do. And yet the policy didn't change. It's not like this had any effect on, you know, the State Department or the CIA. And what's interesting about Alsop is he continued, you know, writing very critical articles about the Soviet Union throughout his career. And they actually tried to embarrass him. They sent the photographs around in like sort of unmarked manila envelopes in wow. Washington about 15 years after the incident. They sent them to some of his worst enemies. And it's interesting. No one did anything with them. Wow. One kind of an example. I mean, you have to understand, Alsop was like a very kind of influential, powerful guy. So he's kind of a special case. But it that does show you how much Washington has changed. Because, you know, if if photographs like that of a prominent journalist or public figure were given to, you know, his worst enemies, you can bet that those photos would be on Twitter within five seconds. Right. right? I mean, there, there isn't that kind of sense of, you know, we're going to protect people of a certain class. I feel like that's kind of broken down now. I think a lot about that with JFK, just how much he was protected. Yes, absolutely. It's so crazy. I mean, yeah, all the journalists knew yeah. what was going on and it was never, that would not happen today at all. It would, like no. you said, it would all be on Twitter in five minutes. Right. Right. So you were talking about the, the kind of, I guess, securitization of, of this being a national security problem, but how did the consciousness, what was the consciousness of homosexuality like in the country at this time? Were people even aware that, mm. you know, how did that come about? That's a good question. So I think 1948 is a really important year because that is when the Kinsey report comes out, which we all kind of learn about and is still very important today. And one of the key findings of the Kinsey report is that 10% of men are essentially homosexual. Now, I actually think that number is probably inflated. I don't mm -hmm. think, I think it's probably half that or less. But this comes out in January 1948, and it's a huge deal. 
And it actually leads to a sort of sex panic in America. You see this real kind of moral hysteria about homosexuality, because all of a sudden, you know, homosexuality was just not something that was talked about. Right. Really. I mean, even the word homosexual was often considered too shameful to say in public. I mean, I write about the first outing in American politics. It happened in 1942 of a of a senator, a Democratic senator from Massachusetts named David Walsh. And when one of his colleagues is, you know, referring to this on the floor of the Senate, he refers to an offense too loathsome to mention <laughs> um, in the presence of ladies and gentlemen on the floor of the United States Senate. So that's kind of, and one of the things I learned writing this book is all the euphemisms that have been devised, right, to describe homosexuality. So this is not something Americans like to talk about. It's a very taboo subject. But then it's sort of thrust into the public consciousness, I think, with the Kinsey Report. Also, World War II and kind of the aftermath of World War II is a big, important moment because World War II is really when a kind of gay consciousness uh, forms in terms of gay people themselves, because they're all sort of, it's the mass mobilization of the military, right? And so you have all sorts of Americans from all different walks of life being kind of thrust together in, in, into military bases and they're being sent overseas and they're on ships in close quarters. And we know from kind of personal histories and testimonies that for a lot of gay people, this was sort of the first time that they encountered other gay people. Wow, that's um, it, really it, interesting. It, yeah, and it's been referred to as a, as a national coming out moment. Uh. And so I think, you know, the aftermath of World War II, you have gay people returning from the war. They're coming back to cities you have sort of gay cultures on, you know, subcultures sort of developing in cities. Homosexuality is becoming more visible in the culture, right? So if you're like living in a city, there might be a gay bar, right? You mm. might see, you might see gay men, you know, maybe walking together on the street. It's becoming a little more visible in life. And then there's the Kinsey report. Was it illegal and, and- anywhere? No, it's le- homosexuality is illegal in every state. Oh, OK. It's not, it's not until 1961 that Illinois becomes the first state to decriminalize it. OK. Wow. 61. I yeah. mean, that seems so it's it actually is amazing how I remember wow. in my 20s telling my dad that we'd probably live to see marijuana and gay marriage legalized, you know, those things. And he was yeah. that just seemed so just unfathomable for him and being I'm 43, so I'm old enough to remember when it was something that even Democrats were not for yeah. and just seeing the progress. I mean, I, I remember during like the whole Trump years when everybody was like, he's the worst president for LG. I'm like, this guy doesn't even care about this stuff. Yeah, that was and having written this book. I, ha- I had to roll my eyes a lot when people would say <laughs> that. I have lots of problems with Trump, but like he's better. He was better on LGBT issues than Bill Clinton. Yeah. You know, (laughs) so that's that's no credit to him. I'm not I'm not giving him any credit. I'm just saying it's a fact. Right. And it's also really historically ignorant to say Trump was the worst. Because, I mean, I just told you what happened during the Eisenhower administration, you know, thousands of people being fired. And it didn't really get better until the 70s in in that regard. So So who was the worst? That's a good question. I think just in terms of the of, yeah, of the harm caused, it would be Eisenhower. Mm hmm. And I wouldn't blame Eisenhower personally for that. I think it was just sort of a confluence of kind of time and place. Mm-hmm. Right? He comes into office at the kind of height of this sex panic merged with this Cold War fear. Right. And so you have these two fears become intertwined. And so it's homosexuals are more liable to be blackmailed. They're also more li- liable to be communists. Mm. Right? These are two. <laughs> These are two groups of people who live in the shadows. They live in secret. Uh, You can't tell them just by looking at them. I'm sure some homosexuals are very flamboyant, right? But if but if one out of every 10 man is is, is a homosexual, then that means a lot of them are very good at disguising themselves. So there's a lot of kind of cultural conflation between the homosexual and the communist. And so Eisenhower's is there at that moment. And I think any any president, anyone who was who would have been president in that year, would have implemented and carried out lavender scare type policies. It was just sort of where the country was headed. If you're asking like who was the most homophobic president, like in his heart, I would have to say almost without a doubt, Richard Nixon. And that's just sort of based on the tapes, you know, the White House tapes and the conversations that he would have. And I've reproduced many of them in the book. 
And today they're kind of funny. You have to chuckle at them. I mean, he's just like ranting at length about how the homosexuals are responsible for the downfall of Greece and Rome. They're ruining women's fashion. That was one of the strangest (laughs) things he said. He's just sort of like obsessed with it in a way, in the same way that he was obsessed with, you know, Jews and blacks and hippies and the establishment and the media. It's just like one group. It's like one more group of people that he can add to his enemies list, you know, Mm -hmm. and he has this kind of obsession with it. But, you know, it's not like it's not like there were lots of gay people being fired left and right in the Nixon administration. It's just sort of him as a person. I think it had to do with his paranoia. Right. He's a very paranoid man. And there's a real kind of conspiratorial element to this to homophobia, as I've been talking about. Right. Sort of gays are seen lurking behind every door. They're involved in every conspiracy, whether it's the communist conspiracy, the conspiracy to kill Kennedy. And he kind of has that mind of, you know, seeing shadows everywhere. Everyone has that mind now. I mean, not everyone, but I see this resurgence of this, what you're talking about. Yeah. And the whole groomer rhetoric. The groomer thing. And I've actually written about this. The, The groomer rhetoric, it really harkens back. I'm glad you made that connection. It really harkens back to really a century of kind of conspiratorial homophobia, right? Yeah. The gay people, the gay people, you can't really trust them. They operate in secret. They recruit. <laughs> yeah, that's an old slander, right? That gay people have because they can't reproduce themselves. They have to recruit children. Right. Um, this is now kind of coming back. This is it's in the groomer rhetoric. The pe- um, pedophile so, accusations. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yesterday I was on Twitter and I was asking because this whole drag queen story hour keeps coming yeah. up yeah. and I I still haven't found and I'm surprised by this. Maybe I just haven't looked hard enough, but I haven't seen a really well reported piece on the history of drag queen story hour that isn't like either the right wing calling everybody pedophiles in this like conspiratorial idea that this is just how, you know, communism infects the children. And it's weird, too, in your book, the the connection of communism and and gays. And I'm mm. seeing a lot of this same conspiratorial yeah. stuff, like a resurgence of it. Or on the left, where it's just, if you even question how this became a thing, Drag Queen yeah. Story Hour, you're a bigot. Right. Yeah. I'm like, I just want to know when the first one was and how like obviously there's money and there has to be a reason this is like a thing yes and i haven't seen that piece (laughs) like can someone someone smarter than me look into this because i think there's i see so much of what we're talking about around this drag queen story hour too this the the language of like oh the grooming and the and it's an it's just a it's a weird time to see I think it's a backlash to a lot, not so much the even gay marriage or anything. It's more the the like gender ideology yeah. and trans activism. Yeah. And that is unfortunate because I think there's been so much progress. And now I'm seeing like I'm worried about this backlash yeah. to this. I am too. I'm actually more worried about the monkeypox potential potential backlash with monkeypox. Oh, yeah, that's interesting, too. Um, Just because it's a disease that is now, you know, almost exclusively in the we can't use the word gay, the men who have men who have sex with men community, right? MSM. But it could spread apparently through touch, through bedsheets. It's unclear, right? So it might be more transmissible than HIV AIDS was. And it's harmful to children, apparently, unlike COVID was. So I'm just there. There are scenarios you know, and I'm and I'm hoping against the worst, but I can see scenarios where sort of gay men are blamed for spreading this disease into the general public. Right, right. You know, hopefully it doesn't get to that, but I can see those scenarios. Of course, yeah. There, it, there's so much. It's so hard to stay sane now. You know, they're even reading your book, and I look. I'm impressed too at just how much information you found still on paper. You know, just in yeah. your research, there's still stuff we can oh, discover. Yeah. Absolutely, and because it, it seems like we live in this time where everything we know everything and all the information is out there, and that's not the case at all. And I think you know the the way the way that people had to live in that kind of in the closet, basically it's, it's just so 
people take it for granted now, especially the young people. They don't they don't really understand what that was like or what that what that did to people. And one of the things you said, I think it was an interview I saw with you was talking about how the closet is almost its own character. Yeah. Yeah. I think the closet is the villain of this. book. Yeah. As opposed to any one individual, you know, you could look at J. Edgar Hoover or, you know, Roy Cohn or some people might want to call out the Reagans, Ronald and Nancy Reagan for not doing enough during AIDS. Uh, And there's a lot to criticize all those figures for. And I do. But it really is. I think the closet is the villain in this book because it made people do terrible things to themselves. In the case of someone like Roy Cohn, right, who was a closeted gay man to other people. Mm -hmm. But the closet was, and I blame straight people for it, frankly. I mean, they were the ones who created this fear of homosexuality, this irrational fear. We now understand that it's an irrational fear. And really, it's hard for me to think of another subject about which there has been a more dramatic transformation in public attitudes Mm. than on homosexuality, right? A more, a, a more swift and dramatic transformation in public attitudes than the view towards homosexuality and gay people. I mean, if you go back 50, 60, 70 years and you look at the way gay people were treated in this country and what the views of them were, just the average person, not far right wing people, just the average person, what their views were of homosexuals was that they were sick, that they were sinners, right? And that they were criminals. And that changed so dramatically for the better that I really think it's a testament to the capacity for positive change. What do you attribute that to? I think it is transparency and it's gay people coming out of the closet, right? Because mm-hmm. and there's this story you probably saw a couple of days ago, right? Where the Republican congressman voted against gay marriage and then three days later <laughs> yes. went to his son's gay marriage. And it's funny, I think, I think that story, more than you know, previous stories where there's like a closeted gay Republican getting caught in a bathroom, right, or having sex with a man, in those stories, there's a smidgen of sympathy because maybe you feel that the person's a little vulnerable right right in this, in this case it's just like sheer dishonesty right right for this man to vote against gay marriage and then go to his own son's marriage it just shows you how ridiculous this position is right and so i think this is more this is more clear i think and and i, and I think it shows people how irrational you know, bigotry or prejudice towards gay people is. And I think the reason is, is that, right? Because there are gay people everywhere. Yeah. There are rich gay people. There are poor gay people. There are white, black, conservative, liberal. They come from small rural, you know, towns in the Midwest. They live in big cities. They're in every culture. And eventually you have a critical mass of those people coming out of the closet over the decades, you know, over, over the years. And it gets to the point where, whereas, you know, in the 70s or the 60s, hardly anyone could report knowing a gay person, of course, many of them did. They were, they just were closeted, right? Right. To so you look at the polls now, and it's something like ninety four percent of every of of all Americans know a gay person, right? And it's just frankly, it's hard to believe these you know crazy conspiratorial, hateful, prejudicial things about gay people when you know one, right? And that is really what I think did did it, and I think that's probably why actually there's probably been more progress on gay, straight, or homosexuality relations, you could say, than perhaps on race. Because, you know, a lot of people in this country don't know people well of, of other races. Right. I mean, it, it's, that's, that's gotten, I mean, clearly we're moving in the right direction on that. Right. But you can, still, you can still grow up in America and really not have interactions with people of different races. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. Uh, that's, that's, I think that's more possible than growing up and not knowing a gay person. Yeah, no, that's that's a really I don't have good the numbers, point. I don't have the numbers, but I just think that that's probably true. Yeah, no, I think that's a really valid point. I am I mean, I moved all over the country and went to schools in the city and in the suburbs and you get into those suburbs in yeah. Minnesota and yeah. they're white. Yeah. <laughs> but there were there were lots of gay kids in my school. Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting, interesting point. I 
I think too, just the the closet, like you said, it just makes people do horrible things to themselves and to other people. That the projection that you're you see from some of these people who are who are trying to shy away from something in themselves that they don't want to look at or admit or concede to, and how that ends up in politics. You know, it's something I never considered. Just how that affects so many other people with these policies and these witch hunts and the real life ramifications of that kind of internalized homophobia in some instances. It's it's really wild. And the impact it had, this like long term impact, like you said, it's this it's this book spans decades. Mm. And you know, J. Edgar Hoover obviously is somebody that everybody talks about, and you kind of debunk a lot of the like fairy tales that people tell yeah. about him. Literal, literal fairy tales. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, what's more interesting to me, like I didn't find any evidence that Hoover was gay. There's no evidence he had sex at all. I mean, I wouldn't have surprised me if he was celibate his entire life. What's more interesting to me is the sort of conception of him as potentially being gay. And there were all these rumors and kind of cultural commentaries um, that Hoover was gay, right? He was a lifelong bachelor. He lived with with his mother for a long time. He had a very close relationship with his number two at the FBI, Clyde Tolson. People certainly talked about it in Washington. And it sets up this interesting paradox, right, where the man who sits atop American law enforcement, whose job it is, is to hunt down all these homosexuals who in some in some respects, maybe the most powerful man in America, right? Because the presidents come and go, but J. Edgar Hoover is there. He's like the face of permanent bureaucracy in Washington, you know? And maybe he's gay. Who knows, right? It's like this scuttlebutt. No one really, there's no evidence, but people joke about it. Certainly the FBI is extremely sensitive to this. And I report all these stories of just like random people being interrogated by the FBI because they made a joke. That anecdote about the lady playing bridge. Yeah, these women playing bridge (laughs) one day and one of them makes a joke about Hoover being a homosexual. And then one of the other women, her nephew's in the FBI and she tells her nephew. And then like the next day, this woman gets a knock on her door. That's crazy. You know, she's summoned to the FBI field office and she's given a lecture and they basically, you know, threaten her not to say this ever again. This happens multiple times over the years. So they're sort of but it shows you, you you know, how how sensitive they are to this and mm-hmm. how how damaging they think that it is, right? If people genuinely believe this about him, they think it's a real problem. If people believe that the, that the director of the FBI is a queer, they see that as a real problem for the Bureau. It calls into question, though, like your ability to say free, speak freely in your own Absolutely. house. <laughs> Absolutely. That's no, why I mean, for gay people, you know, for gay people, it really was a police state in, in America. Uh, really until the 1970s, I think you could say, particularly for gay men, because, you know, the way that gay men would meet and have sex and socialize was much more heavily policed than that of lesbians, right? Lesbians aren't going in public parks and cruising and, right. you know, they're not being arrested by the police. Their bars aren't being raided to the same extent. And, you know, to be gay in this era, it was like almost being in a police state. I mean, you were surveilled, your, you know, your magazines were seized by the post office, your bars were raided, your civil rights organizations were spied upon. It was really a, a different a different era, that's for sure. What are the books that have been written about this other than yours? You said there was really only one other book that was written. So, yeah, there's one book called The Lavender Scare. There's another good book about a biography of sort of the first gay rights activist in America named Frank Kameny. It's called The Deviance War that came out a couple of years ago. Is there a, is there anything been written about gays in the military? I know that seems to be yeah. a recurring theme. And there's a there's a pretty big, important book called Conduct Unbecoming. Mm. It was written by Randy Schiltz, who was sort of the first openly gay journalist in a major American newspaper. He worked at the San Francisco Chronicle in the 1980s. And he also wrote the sort of definitive book on the early years of the AIDS crisis called And the Band Played On. Mm. Um, And he also wrote a book called Conduct Unbecoming, which is a history of homosexuality in in the military. And that book and and that book went up to like the Gulf War. So it didn't it doesn't he died of AIDS in the 1990s. So 
Uh, there've been a, probably a few books written about the kind of end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. But yeah, very little written about, you know, what what, what I wrote my book about, which is why I wrote a, a book about it. <laughs> yeah, nothing. It seems it's it's just such a fascinating topic and perspective that I think is so important. It And it does. I feel like there was a review that said that it was just like char- characters like Forrest, many Forrest Gumps. Mm. Yeah, that recur throughout all of these. And I loved that because it does feel like there's all these characters that just played such influential roles and they were kind of everywhere. Yeah. What I wanted to do was really write a parallel history. It's not an alternative history. Mm -hmm. It's not a revisionist history. It's basically saying, look, here are all these stories that you know about American history, about whether it's World War Two or the early years of the Cold War, or McCarthyism, or Camelot and the Kennedys, and Nixon and Watergate, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a kind of gay angle to Watergate. And I'm, you know, providing all these sorts of, I'm basically showing you the parallel gay history that, mm-hmm. that runs alongside all these phenomena that you didn't know existed. So that's basically what I set out to do. It's so cool. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Watkins Welcome is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. What was the hardest part for you of researching this book and, and writing it? Was there, like, if there was a dark night of the soul while you were going through this process, did you experience one? That's a good question. I think putting it into manageable size, Mm -hmm. knowing what to cut, because as you say, it's a big book. It was a lot longer, believe me, in its initial first draft. I bet. You know what actually for me was probably the hardest was I think just getting the writing style right, the prose style, because I come from a kind of reporting and opinion journalism background, and I'm used to kind of writing in declarative sentences and making an argument, right? And this was just a different kind of writing, a kind of writing narrative history. Yeah, it's it was storytelling. Storytelling. Yeah. And it's a, you know, I've never written a book like this before. My last book was a it was a kind of reported book about contemporary politics. And writing a narrative history in an engaging way was was a challenge. And I probably stressed out the most over that, actually. It wasn't necessarily the research, any particular, you know, interviews or deciding, you know what to keep secret, you know, how to, how to, how, how open I could be writing about certain t- subjects. I think it was just like the prose style. Mm. And what I did was I just read a lot of what I considered to be the kind of gold standard of, you know, those sorts of histories. So I was really trying to model the book off of, you know, Robert Caro, who wrote the power broker about Robert Moses and his multi-volume biography of Lyndon Johnson, uh, which I consider really the kind of greatest, you know, biographical, really kind of the greatest American history, work of American history, I think, is that series of books. And I was I was trying to model myself on the kind of Caro style. Wow. You did a great job. I mean, it definitely carries you through. I know books like this can be intimidating just to look at in their real form. And it's always a relief when you start reading it and you're like, oh, it's good writing. <laughs> Thank you. <I laughs> it's not something that. that I have to just labor through. It's something that carries you through it. And that's why I was wondering how you kind of came about, you know, com- putting it all together. But then you get all this information, then you have to make it readable and interesting. It just takes a long time. It seems you know? so I, hard. <laughs> and I just had to kind of accommodate myself to that. Again, like I come from 
journalism were like, you know, you have a deadline that day and then the article is published tomorrow, you know? And I just had to say, you know what? Like this project will not be finished for years. Right. right? And so you have to like set, de- you know, like there's a deadline in a month, right? And it's for a chapter. And then there's a deadline m- months later and that's for a section, right? And so I had to kind of plot it like that. And once you do that and you you can see ahead to where you're going, every day you're just sort of putting a brick in the wall and you're working towards it. Wow. Um, and look, this book took me longer than I thought it would take. And there were multiple deadline extensions, but you have to pace yourself. You have to pace yourself. And that was probably the biggest challenge, actually, now that I think of it, it was really pacing myself because mm-hmm. I'm I'm not used to this kind of, you know, uh, I've never done a project of this immen- immense length before. And it, and it just was, a, it just required putting myself in a different headspace. I had to get off Twitter, right? I had to give my my Twitter password to my partner. I wasn't reading and following the news as much as I usually do, right? I had to kind of remove myself from the daily, yeah. you know, the world of daily uh, Twitter battles and fights and news cycles. And I had to kind of, you know, trans- I had to transport myself back in time. Wow. It's actually really great. I actually had a lot of fun going to these archives and just like finding stuff. That's so cool. You know, because it's like you were saying earlier, it's like, yeah, like not everything is on the internet. And yeah, there's actually a lot to be found in like dusty old boxes in in archives. And like I found numerous great stories that have never been told before. No one knew anything about these stories. And if I had to give advice to like young writers or journalists, it's like get off Twitter, get off the internet, like go to an archive. Wow. Like, just, just ask the archivist, you know, what what collections do you have that are interesting? You know, and just mm-hmm. go through those archives because I guarantee you, you will find fascinating material. Did you learn anything about yourself in this process? I think I developed a real sense of gratitude as a gay man living today, just realizing how much how much harder my life would have been if mm-hmm. I had been born in this era. And that's really, you asked me, why did I write this book? This is another reason. I mean, I'm someone very interested in politics and government and journalism and international affairs, right? And I was blessed to be born where I was, the the family that accepted me, friends, all that, right? But if I had been born in a different, in this era, you know, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had the life that I've had. I wouldn't have the the opportunities would not have been available to me. You know, just being a journalist, getting a job at a magazine, you know, like, I'm I'm actually I'm here in Provincetown this week and I I'm seeing my friend Andrew Sullivan who was oh. uh, who was the editor of the New Republic who was really one, also one of the first openly gay journalists in America at that time. You know, he came he was there in the late 80s. And you know, people like him opened the door for right. people like me. And going even further back, I'm writing you know like Frank Kameny who I mentioned who really becomes like the first openly gay person in America when he decides to sue the federal government in 1957. And so I just I just have an immense sense of gratitude for the people who came before me, because like you said, it's like we just take it for granted. Yeah. The courage that, that it took back then to come so out courage. or even. I mean, and I, I, I show the photo in my book of the first gay rights march outside the White House in 1965, which is four years before Stonewall. Right. Everyone knows about Stonewall, mm-hmm. the Stonewall uprising. Not many people know that there was a march for gay rights outside the White House in 1965. Wow. You look at these people and most of them are wearing sunglasses, right? Because they don't want to be, they know that photos are being taken. They don't, but still it takes, it takes a lot of courage to do that. Yeah. This is the most despised group of people, homosexuals. I mean, they are, they are just the worst. They're sex criminals. They're sexual psychopaths. This is how they're talked about. And uh, to go from that to where we are today, I just think it's a, it's an amazing tribute to the virtues of a free society, of uh, free expression, the First Amendment, because none of this would have been possible without the First Amendment Mm. and the ability that gay people had to tell their own story and to argue their case. Um, So, yeah, I think that's what I that's what I learned. And also it's, you know, I'm 38 years old. I was writing this book when I was like 36, 37. That that just happened to be the year that like a lot of the major characters in my book were doing the things that they were doing. It's like Frank Kameny, who I mentioned, he was like in his late thirties. Right. This happened. There's an aide to LBJ who I write about, who's never been written about before 
Robert Waldron, whose story is very heartbreaking. He was gay and he was, you know, fired just just weeks at, you know, he was working in the White House and he got he got kicked out because he was gay. He was like 36 when it happened. I was like 36 when I was writing the book. Late 30s was like the average age of gay men when they were dying of AIDS Mm -hmm. in their late 30s. That's crazy. It was sort of a weird thing that I was writing this book at this age when this age was so pivotal to like all the kind of, and maybe that's sort of, maybe the late thirties are when lots of people do, you know, no matter what their lives are, maybe that's, maybe that's a time in your life when you are, you know, it's, it, I feel like it's a real transition period, right? right? Like you're no longer in your twenties, really you're, you're approaching your forties, right? right? So you're really, you're like middle age is sort of haunting you. Yeah. You can see it, right. So I feel like that was kind of the right time for me to write this book. Cause it, I felt like I was doing this, this, you know, this kind of incredible work that I would not have been able to do in my twenties. I mean, I started, I started research on this book in my twenties mm-hmm. and I conceived the idea for it when I was like 24 or 25, but it's funny. It took me a long, I couldn't do it in my twenties. Yeah. The I discipline. Struggled. <laughs> I struggled, but it was more than that. It was like, I wasn't mature enough. Right. I was I was struggling with the proposal. I hadn't read enough. I didn't know enough. Right, right. I had this idea. I knew it was a really good idea for a great book, but I really struggled with it. And I didn't get around to really working on it intensively until like 2017, 2018, actually. Wow. Right. And it just it just took me. And I think there are certain projects where you can't do them until you're a certain age. Right. Yeah. I think that's true of, of lots of things in life where. So true. You just, you just don't have the maturity. You don't have the knowledge. I think comedians um, get better with age just because yeah. they have more life yeah. and experience and maturity. Absolutely. And I mean, you're God, when I was, I think about just how delusional and insane I was in my twenties, you know, just, I mean, <laughs> just I, look back on maniac. Stuff, I look back on stuff that I wrote in my early twenties and I'm like, I would have hated me right. in, my, in my early 20s. That's why I hate like, the culture that we live in right now that doesn't allow elevate. for anybody to like change or evolve at all. Yes. People will point to something that I said back in 2015 when I was writing for Playboy, and I'm like, yeah, that was seven years ago. Yeah. I, I hope that yeah. I'm not that same person. I'm married yeah. now. I have a child. Like my, yeah. I've been exposed to all kinds of different things I've traveled and gone places. I, I hope right. that I don't sound the same. Yeah. And people will kind of hold your ass to the fire for something you, and I'm like, I would hate that girl, hate the girl that I was. And well, and this is interesting because I think it's really true of gay people because we're all in the closet for some point of our lives. Yeah. I was going to ask you that if it's not too personal, where were no. you ever in the closet? I, absolutely. I came out when I was 18, freshman mm-hmm. year of college. Right. But gay people change a lot. Mm-hmm. Probably more than the average straight person. I mean, you see all sorts of gay people when they're closeted, you know, they behave in ways that they later come to regret. Right. Mm-hmm. They're they're, You know, maybe they're dating women and they're doing it and they know it's wrong and they know, but they're doing it to keep up appearances. Right. Yeah. And a lot of, you know, a lot of gay men are home when, when they're closeted. They project homophobia right. towards other gay men. Right. You know, and I've had, I've, I've met, I've, I've like re-encountered people that I knew when I was younger who were closeted when I knew them and now they're out and they're so much happier and they're so much better people. And they might even like apologize. They're like, I'm sorry. I, w- I, I did these things to you when I was in the closet. And this is when you talk about the closets of villain. Yeah. I mean, you probably know people like that when they were closeted, they were miserable. Yeah. And I, I see, yeah, I, I do know a lot of people like that. And then there's just so much relief that comes with being free and you're being able to be yourself. And yeah, that, that just seems, I haven't had to experience that. And I know many people who have, and that story of that secret that you live with personally, that you can't even admit to yourself a lot of the time. And I I imagine even now, still, it's still hard for kids and people. Sure. But I imagine back then how hard it would be to admit that truth to yourself before you could even admit it to anybody else. Yeah. At least now we have the psychological kind of ability to perhaps, like the younger generation, 
seeing the pride flags everywhere, having it be ubiquitous everywhere, that there is more ability for them to admit it to themselves. And I think that's something that when I was reading your book, I'm like, God, it must have been just impossible to even recognize this in yourself let alone like admit it to the world or your friends. Mm -hmm. And we do just take these, that, that kind of progress gives me so much hope. I found yeah. that's what I love about your book is that not only is it, I do feel that gratitude you have for the people who came before you and honoring their stories, but it also makes me hopeful because everything right now feels so negative focused yes. as if yes. there's been no progress at all and our society should just like throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is just all horrible. And I don't feel that way. You know, I don't, I feel, I feel optimistic in many, many ways. I see, I have young nieces and nephews and like the Gen Z is kind of badass. You know, they're, they're, there's so many cool kids doing cool things and, and they're so open-minded. This generation that was raised online, they're like, like so much of the stuff that we banter about online, I'm like, these kids mm. don't care. Yeah. Like in 10 years, this isn't going to be a thing because these kids right. just don't care about this stuff. Right, right. Or they'll become radicalized. So maybe there's that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So did you have to out anyone in your book? So I outed two men, both of whom are dead. Okay. Uh, and my rules about outing, first of all, when it comes to someone who's alive, I I really oppose it in only the most rare circumstances. If you can point me to someone who is, you know, using their power. Like that guy who the, went to his son's wedding. <laughs> well, he If he was gay, well, he's not gay. Right? No, I know. But if he was, would, would you? If he was gay, maybe. Although, you know, I'll tell you, there, there's a story I tell in the book of a man named Oliver Sippel, who was an ex-Marine. And in 1975, he's in San Francisco, and he saves the life of Gerald Ford, President Ford, during an assassination attempt. And Sippel, you know, he had moved to San Francisco to escape his very conservative family in Detroit. Like, by the way, like a lot of gay people in San Francisco in the early 70s. That's why they all moved there, right? Now, Harvey Milk, who at the time was becoming a kind of big political figure in San Francisco, he wanted the world to know that Oliver Sippel was gay. Because mm -hmm. he thought it would help the gay rights movements, right? If right. Everyone knew that the man who saved the president of the United States was a gay ex-Marine. And he leaks it to a journalist. and It becomes a huge story. But what happens is, is that Oliver Sipple's family then totally rejects him. His mother, you know, gives an interview to a newspaper where she's like, oh, we were so proud of Oliver. And then we found out he's a queer. And now I can't even leave the house. I'm so ashamed. When she died, his father wouldn't even let him attend the funeral. Wow. And he ends up drinking himself to death. Oh, that's so, so sad. Yeah. Like, this is why, you know, when you're outing someone or when you're contemplating it, like you don't know what's going on in that person's life. Right? right. So you better have a damn good reason to do it. And that's why I'm very wary of it. When you're dead, you belong to history. Right. <laughs> and so the two people who I name, one of them, was Richard Nixon's chief speechwriter, a man named Ray Price. And I think that's justified because it shows you that, you know, Richard Nixon, who I just mentioned, was like the most homophobic president. He could be the most homophobic president and say all these terrible things about gay people and yet have his chief speechwriter be a gay man. Right. By, the way, he knew, by the way, he knew he was gay. Right. So I think that, that that provides us an interesting window into the mind, the psyche of a president, of, of Richard Nixon. And by the way, it's like several presidents who had close gay friends or advisors yet had public policies that harmed gay people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that like that to me was, you know, my kind of contributing to history, right? Mm -hmm. Richard Nixon had a gay, a gay chief speechwriter. That's worth knowing. And then the other man I out was a man named Peter Hannaford, who was also very close a speechwriter, advisor, consultant to Ronald Reagan. Wow. And he was at the center of this scandal that I mentioned. He was one of the men who was named by these other Republicans who were trying to, you know, locate this kind of gay cabal controlling Ronald Reagan. Peter <laughs> Hannaford was Peter Hannaford was actually one of them. He was gay and he was denied. He he did not go into the Reagan administration. Mm. He, was, he was he was on the campaign. He was a very close advisor. He didn't go into the Reagan White House. It might have been because he was gay. Wow. He might have he might have been blocked 
by Ed Meese, who was the counselor to the president's senior advisor. And so I think that's also an important thing to know. You know, he was an important figure in Ronald Reagan's political life, and uh, he may have been denied a job in the White House because he was gay. So those are the two people whom I out. But I don't, you know, that's that's who I limit it to. And look, if there if there had been others, and if, and if it had been relevant to the story, then I would have identified them. But right. there weren't any other, there there weren't any other any other names that came up that seemed, you know, important enough or significant enough. You take a you take a topic that I generally have a very hard time finding any interest in and make it so interesting for me because I generally my brain just does not absorb administrations, you know, like presidents oh. and their administrations. And I I love to- talking to policy wonks and people, historians and people who know exactly who is who and all of the administrations. And I'm, I'm like, I can't remember names. <laughs> I can't, I don't even know how any of these people are connected. And I feel like an idiot, but you make it actually really interesting. It's just not my my lane at all. <laughs> well, I had to I had to put a uh, cast of characters in the beginning pages yeah. of the book. <laughs> that was helpful my, to me. <laughs> well, for my own sake too, because there are lots of names in this book and I needed to organize them and and clarify it in that way. <laughs> well, it was very helpful to somebody like myself. Oh, I had no idea that Roy Cohn died of AIDS, by the way. Oh yeah. Yeah. No yeah. Idea. And that was actually when that was when Donald Trump basically abandoned him. Oh. Uh, when, once Cohn got AIDS, Donald Trump didn't want anything to do with him. Didn't wouldn't return his phone calls. Kind of dropped him. Wow, that somehow doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you the same two questions I ask at the end of all my podcasts, which are a little sure. more personal. What is your biggest defect of character? My biggest defect. It can be character. however you interpret it. It can be like today or throughout your life or. There's so many. There's so many. I'm going to have to scroll through them. I would say a probably short temper. Mm. I have a very short temper. I get I get flustered very easily. Interesting, because it seems like it would take an enormous amount of patience and, and and not not having a short temper to write a book this well, intense. There were a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kept it in check, I guess, when writing the book. But I can, you know, I can be pretty short tempered, you know, like when little stupid things happen to you in your day, I can, I can get frazzled, you know what I mean? Stuff yeah. Like that. Yeah. And what is your biggest asset? My biggest assets. I think I am considerate. Mm, I love that. I think, I think you'd have to ask my friends. <laughs> I love P-Town. I hope you have fun. Have you been before? I'm from Newport. So oh. yeah, my uncle is gay and we okay. grew. Yeah. So, so I'm in the neighborhood. It's a great place. <laughs> it yeah. is. It is. I, I really appreciate you and your, this book. I hope it's doing well, right? I think it was yeah, on the bestseller list. And, it was on the Times bestseller list. Yeah. yeah. That's exciting. You know, the other thing that I appreciate is that this, I've read so many books in the past four years doing this podcast yeah. and I look at my shelf and I'm like, it's all the same book. Yes. It's like the same ver. like democracy is dying yeah. and I'm not yeah. knocking anybody who's writing any of these books. It's just the, they're very much grounded in the news cycle. I feel. Yes. And this book, I was like, it was like a nice relief yes. to just read I'm some so history. Glad. I'm, I'm really gratified you'd say that. Cause it's really one of the, one of the reasons I wrote this book is because 2016 came along and I was getting so tired of these same mantras, right? And everyone kind of writing the same thing. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do something totally different. Yeah. I'm just going to write a book about history, about gay people, about hidden histories of gay people in government. And it's just something completely different. No, and it's so cool. So, yeah. It's not like, yeah, everybody's getting canceled and everybody's, yeah. you know, I... <laughs> It is like all all books are that pretty much, right? It's that or Trump is a fascist. Or I, I, I'm, <laughs> yeah, like woke ink or whatever. You yeah. know, like the wokes are coming. Um, <laughs> and again, I don't want to knock any of many right. of these Some people. Some of those books are good. Some of those books are really they're good. They're really good. And in five, 10 years, when we're all eating rats over oil drums, we're going to be like, you know, these guys are right. Uh, when we're using the pages from those books to stay warm. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll be like, maybe they were onto something. We should have paid attention. <laughs> but right now it is. I was saying to my husband, I'm like, it's all the same book. And this is just the nice. It's just it was like a nice, refreshing glass of water and the books I've read. And I will finish it. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. It's been hard with mom brain. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. Mom thank you. Like thank you so much. Video. Well, I hope to meet you in person sometime. And yeah, absolutely. this has been so much fun. Where can we find you? My website, James Kirchick, K-I-R-C-H-I-C-K dot com. Many people forget that final C. <laughs> and the way to remember it is what one of my very prescient camp counselors told me when I was 10 <laughs> years old. He called me Kirchick Magnet. <laughs> <laughs> like chick magnet, right? Uh -huh. And he must have known something about me that I didn't know about myself when I was 10 about why that would be funny because he came up with that nickname. For That's me. hilarious. It's, it's a good way to remember my because everyone everyone misspells my last name. Uh, there's a C at the end. And that's my my Twitter is Jay Kirchick. So and I don't do you know what you're doing next? That's a good question. I have some ideas for book for next book projects um, <laughs> that I'm gonna, and I want to do, you know, what you were saying earlier about not, not producing another book that everyone is writing. That's very much at the forefront of my brain. So you're not going to yeah. do like the wokes are coming. The world no, is ending. So. <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. We'll see. Uh, nice. Might be true. <laughs> might be true. Well, I, I appreciate you and I'm Thank just you. so grateful for this, the amount of effort that it took to put this together. It will. It's a book that will be evergreen. So thank well, you. Thank you, Bridget. I really appreciate that. All month long, the biggest movies are streaming free on Pluto TV's Popcorn Summer Movies. Watch star-studded blockbusters like Titanic and Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. Or fall in love with charming rom-coms like Hitch and How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. The best part? Pluto TV is 100% free. No credit cards, not even a sign-up. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies, TV shows, and more. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming now. Pluto TV. Drop in. Watch free. There's no check-in this week because we're on vacation. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> the dumbest line. <laughs>